Okay, uh, we're very happy to have uh, uh, with us today Josh Tenenbaum. Uh, Josh is a, has been scripting the lab in uh, psychology and machine learning uh, for uh, years now. Uh, he uh, graduated from BCS, very uh, cognitive science at MIT, and then spent some time in Stanford before returning uh, in the psychology department in Stanford, and then before, before returning to MIT. And he's uh, well known for, uh, I, I assume also for <coughs> psychology, we, I know him mostly for his contributions uh, in machine learning and uh, in computer vision, where uh, many of uh, his contributions have been uh, inspired by cognitive science and similarly bringing ideas from uh, Bayesian, uh, uh, Bayesian learning and, uh, and machine learning into cognitive science. Uh, Josh is also known for uh, accompanying the uh, talk by retributive dance. Uh, Only back in the old days. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but presumably not today. <laughs> okay, so a little bit. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. Um, so yes, yeah, so as Nani mentioned, uh, I kind of live in these two worlds. I, I usually say cognitive science and AI these days, but whatever. Studying intelligence in humans, minds, and sometimes brains, and studying intelligence in machines. And I think that these two enterprises have something to do with each other, right? That our best science of intelligence in in human minds is done in engineering terms. When I talk about reverse engineering, what I mean is basically coming up with theories and models of how human minds are do intelligent things that look like engineering. And as a result, if we do that, it's gonna hopefully let us engineer more human-like intelligence in machines just to transfer ideas in both directions. Um, it's an exciting time to be trying to do this in all sorts of ways. Um, I think uh, maybe most obviously, we. A lot of you work on this kind of thing, uh, but anyone who doesn't reads about it in the papers. Um, in, in, in some sense, AI, this long dreamed about field, has become real in that we now have all these technologies which do things that uh, would have surely impressed any of the founders of the field, right? You know, vision, language technology, self driving cars, machines that play games, all these things, right? Um, and yet, what we have, what I, what I think I'm, I want to call AI technologies, namely, these are systems which do something at human level that we used to have no idea how humans did in computational terms, and maybe even used to think that in order to do these things, we would have had to have solved some big AI problem. We don't really have any real AI, right? We don't have um, any systems that in particular have the kind of flexible general purpose intelligence that is the hallmark of human intelligence. That's, all, that's what I'm trying to understand. When I say here, I'm talking about common sense, that means different things to different people. I have a feeling it means something rather different to a few of you than to me, but I'll, I'll explain very clearly what I mean by this. Um, the, the, but before I get to that, the, the, the real target, though, is, is, is thinking about the, you know, what is it that enables you, for example, to do all these things, to recognize objects, to recognize faces, to understand language, to drive a car, even to play Jeopardy, not as well as the world's experts, but in just a few minutes, you can, do, you can learn to do any of these things, right? I mean, it's quite remarkable with cars that we're willing to put our teenagers behind the wheel with very, very minimal driver education. As a parent of, of about to be 15-year-old, I'm quite... Where is that? <laughs> right? Um, or, you know, you can figure out the rules to Jeopardy in just a few minutes. How are you able to do that? Well, let me let me start off by talking about a, a, a sort of a success story that we're all familiar with, right? Over the last, let's say, 50 to 60 years, there's there's been progress on bridges between the natural side of intelligence and brains and minds and the engineering side that, you know, mostly these days is known as neural networks. Um, but I would say really what this is about is pattern recognition, right? Machines that were originally inspired by very basic circuit motifs in the brain, something about how neurons work and send information to other neurons, um, which then, if you go beyond just a single neuron that gets input from a few others, and you stack these into big layered architectures, you know, what we used to call multi-layer perceptrons and now call various sorts of deep neural networks, over a few, over you know, a couple of decades, people built these models out. Um, in particular, uh, Jan LeCun was sort of built some of the first real applications of these deep convolutional networks to reading handwritten digits, characters, and so on. And it was driven both by building these architectures out, but also generating the right data sets to train them. So, right, like when Jan and colleagues uh, built the MNIST data set, that was, a, that was one of the first big data sets in machine learning, where they took thousands of examples of real-world categories, like handwritten digits, and they used that to both you know, train the system to solve digit recognition problems in ways you could deploy it in, say, check reading and so on, zip code reading. But also, it was just a test bed for developing the general ideas of deep convolutional networks that then, you know, a few years later, when you started to get data sets that got to more and more categories, more and more interesting <laughs> objects, like, you know, for, 
example, the ImageNet data set with thousands of examples of thousands of natural image uh, categories of objects, these same kinds of architectures could then do quite remarkable things in terms of solving these pattern recognition problems. So I'm not going into any of the details because I think most people here are familiar with this story. And you know, by applying these deep convolutional nets, which were originally engineered to solve the problem of just, say, recognizing handwritten digits, to these larger kind of uh, natural image problems, really this has revolutionized computer vision in the last few years, and even in a way that's come back to neuroscience. So this is just a few examples of projects from some of my MIT colleagues, like uh, Jim DiCarlo's lab, his former postdoc Dan Yeamans, who's now at Stanford, or Tommy Pojo's lab, Tomas Sayre, who's now at Brown, where you know, they've shown these same kinds of deep architectures, which were originally inspired by neuroscience. You can take them back and actually use them to make sense of what neurons in the brain and what's called the ventral stream, like sort of this part of the brain, which is passing the, the sort of a feed forward architecture that in the first, say, 100, 200 milliseconds of vision is able to do something like detecting objects. And you, know, you can actually explain a lot of the variants of what neurons in this stream of the brain are doing with these same kinds of architectures. So this is an example of a, of a successful bridge between engineering and reverse engineering intelligence but specifically for certain problems of pattern recognition. And I think um, where my attention is drawn to, and I, I hope some of yours too, is in what else is there to intelligence, <laughs> right? Um, some people think that maybe if you just scale these things up with big enough data sets, uh, more and more layers or something, that that's going to somehow magically become intelligent. But I think that's kind of crazy. Um, mostly because there's nothing wrong with neural networks. Neural networks are great for pattern recognition. But intelligence is a lot more than pattern recognition. It's many things, but the part that, that we're focusing on our work and what I want to talk about here are aspects of intelligence which I, I, could call, I want to call modeling the world, right? That we don't just recognize patterns of data, but we actually explain and understand what we see. Okay? We, we can imagine things that we could see but haven't yet. We can plan actions and solve problems to make those things real. And when we learn, we actually build new models of the world, sometimes and often by reusing parts of old models and combining them in new ways to make increasingly you know, flexible, general, new model building tools. All right? um, if, if you're interested in some of these general differences, there's uh, together with a few colleagues, former students and postdocs, we put out a big paper. It's, I don't know, it's sort of a big review manifesto thing. It's on archive. It's called Building Machines That Learn and Think Like People. And we talk a lot about the themes that I'm going to discuss today with some, exa some of the same examples and some other ones. If you're interested in it, definitely I, I would like you to check it out. Partly also because it's it's just been accepted for peer commentary in the journal Behavioral and Brain Sciences. So if you find it either, if you like it, if you don't like it, if you want to debate with us or engage, it's a great opportunity in the next few weeks to send in just that you just you can write a paper to it. You know, I know a bunch of other people are already doing that, and we think it hopefully will see an interesting discussion. If you, if you want more details about how to do that, let me know. Okay. Um, so so I'm, I'm going to talk about some of these modeling activities. And I want to emphasize that the difference between pattern recognition and modeling is not just the difference between perception and cognition. In fact, most of what I'm going to talk about here are, you could think of them as either hard problems of perception or problems that are at the interface of perception and cognition. Where I think you can see these kinds of model building activities at work in our brains and minds captured in engineering terms that, you know, are, are engaged in a, well, let's see, they're, they're, they're not as hard as, for example, some of the problems that David is interested in, like natural language semantics or the origins of mathematics, which I think are really great deep problems. But I'm, I'm trying to work on problems here, which I think are sort of just one or two steps away from where current progress is in pattern recognition based I. We, we want to try to give a path to get to these deep problems of common sense. So I'm going to talk about, in particular, two, two kind of parts of the talk. The first half about one-shot learning, where the basic question is, how can we learn so much from so little? How can we learn a new concept, let's say a new object concept, from maybe just one or a few examples? Very different from the, the current trend in pattern recognition where you're trying to you know, get many thousands of examples and see what they all have in common. Um, and then what I've uh, turned, you know, both of these are kind of common sense ideas, things that any kid does quite well compared to any current machine system. But then turning to what I call common sense scene understanding. How do we see a whole world of objects and their, their physical relations and actions and maybe even the goals of other people, not just seeing patterns and pixels, but really seeing the things out there that really matter to us in our common sense construals of the world. The general approach that we're going to be presenting here is, uh, in you know, many ways, an old one. Um, it sometimes goes by the name of analysis by synthesis, 
or inference in generative models. Um, vision people like to trace this idea to Helmholtz in the 19th century, the idea that what the visual system is doing is in some way modeling the causal processes of how images are formed from scenes, right? By a scene, I mean some stuff out there in the world, in the three-dimensional world, and images are formed by light bouncing off the stuff and coming into our eyes. And one way to think about vision is inverting that, that causal model of image formation to make an inference about what is the best way to explain what I see based on what's out there. Okay. Um, so that's an old idea, but it's only recently that we've been able to take it seriously and, and make it from a computational point of view. It's old in cognitive science, cognitive psychology. This is a figure, well, from a review paper that we wrote recently, but it's really a, a based on very almost a copy of a figure or set of figures from uh, Ulrich Neisser's book, Cognitive Psychology. This was the first book on cognitive psychology. It was called that, Cognitive Psychology, kind of invented the field with that name, um, kind of like Tom Mitchell's machine learning book kind of put the name on that field. This book in 1967 suggested this idea as a unifying paradigm for vision, audition, object recognition, speech recognition, language understanding, and planning, that something like you know hierarchies of structured generative processes uh, that, that the brain could build to model what's out there in the world, and that that's really the objects of thought. That's very much the idea that we're going to be trying to develop here. Um, what allows us to make this, this real now, and not just draw these sorts of pictures, is a set of tools that uh, we'll refer to broadly as probabilistic programs. So um, how many people, is that word in your lexicon? Raise your hand if it is. <laughs> okay, raise your hand if you haven't really heard it before. It's only very vague. Okay. So, um, I assume, raise your hand if you know what a Bayesian network is. Okay, good. So um, you can think of what I mean by probabilistic programs, and this, this, this view is nicely articulated in Zubin Garmani's uh, recent Nature review paper. Nature last year had a uh, sort of AI special issue. There was an article on deep neural networks by the, the three of the four horsemen of that field, Hinton and Lacoon and Joshua Bengio, and Zubin had, some, had something on uh, for the more probabilistic uh, approach to AI in which he, he very nicely wrote about probabilistic programs and how they develop the ideas of graphical models, like, for example, Bayes nets. And one way to think of it is to say, well, a, a Bayes net is a directed graphical model where you can interpret the nodes as referring to things or processes or events in the world, and the arrows as some kind of abstraction of a cause-effect a cause cause relation. Um, but again, as we know, when we write our computer programs, right, when we build our scientific theories, there's many kinds of causal processes in the world for which a graph just isn't enough. I mean, maybe a graph is a rough abstraction, but to actually <coughs> have an implementable, runnable model, you need a computer program. And the graph is at best like a flowchart schematic description of what goes on in the computer program. So probabilistic programs are basically ways of defining probabilistic generative models on top of programs, where the program, the usually deterministic structure of the program, describes the causal processes in the world. And then when there's parameters or inputs to the program that we're uncertain about, we put distributions on them to reflect our lack of knowledge. And then we will, say, typically condition those programs because they're generative models. We'll condition them on maybe observing some of their outputs and then try to make Bayesian inferences back to working about what were the likely inputs or some of the likely parameters or even functions inside the program that would have best explained the observed outputs we saw. So really what I'm going to be trying to do here is to show you how these tools of probabilistic programs can capture some of these aspects of common sense model building and explaining the world, and even some aspects of learning as you know, something like program induction in this kind of a probabilistic language of thinking. Um, I will also occasionally bring in neural networks and say, because I don't want this talk to be seen as, an, it's not an anti-neural network talk. I'm trying to talk about both what are the gaps between what where we're currently making most progress on AI technology, much of it driven by neural nets and other pattern recognition technology. But I want to talk about also what's the larger place of pattern recognition and effective mechanisms for pattern recognition, like neural nets, in this bigger picture of intelligence. And I'll show you various ways where we've been trying to use neural nets as, as part of, in particular, learning to do inference efficiently in these more richly structured models. So let's let's first talk about the one-shot learning case. Right? Um, and what I'm going to be talking about here is work that maybe some of you have seen before. It got a, a really a huge amount of press, actually, about 100 times more press than anything I've were done all combined together. Uh, part of that, you know, it was, it was, it was a, this was a paper that my former student, Brendan Lake, did based on his PhD thesis. It was published in Science, it was even on the cover of Science, um, and, uh, and then picked up by lots of newspapers, uh, very, very actively promoted by the AAAS. Of course, we're grateful for that, and I think this work is really nice work. Um, but, you know, the fact that it got so much attention is really a sign both of how much interest there is in the world in AI. Um, 
And this was, you know, we this was actually, I mean, again, science and this as a machine intelligence project. Uh, we thought of it as an enterprise in bridging human and machine learning. But also, you know, how much there really is, you know, people really do, I think, recognize that there are aspects of AI and, even, and machine learning that we need, in some sense, a more richer model building approach for, right? Our current pattern recognition approach is just really not enough. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in this work, another thing I would point you to is Brendan's um, web page and GitHub site, where I think probably the most lasting specific contribution of what he did here is to generate a really, really nice data set and a, a sort of a paradigm for building, test, testing approaches to these more interesting kinds of model building. So if, you, if you're interested in any of these ideas, I urge you to look at both his, his, his data sets and also some of his experimental paradigms that you might try to use yourself uh, to, to, you know, to develop your own approaches to these kind of problems. So the, the problem, though, that the, the really the human learning problem that we were trying to solve is this ability that we have, even from early childhood, to learn a new concept, let's say a new object concept, from just one instance. So the first time you saw one of these segues over there, uh, you probably had no difficulty recognizing other segues, uh, probably if you saw a segue tour in the city or something. How, how many people, that's the first time you saw a segue? <laughs> Yeah, or, okay, you know, if you see one and then a whole stream goes by. But you can also recognize other ones. So probably you have no trouble recognizing these as instances of the same type of thing, while these other objects are different types of things. Um, in case you forgot what it was like to learn a new object concept like this, uh, here I'll, I'll introduce one that probably most of you haven't seen before, <coughs> unless, uh, well, unless you're in one of two categories. Um, so how many people know what that thing is on the, uh, on the top there? Raise your hand if you do. Okay, how many people uh, are rock climbers? How many people have seen me give this talk before? So I, I, what I hypothesize is that if you only know what that is if you're a rock climber or you've seen this talk before, or maybe you're a fan of rock climbing like me. Most of you have don't know what that is. It's a rather specialized piece of rock climbing equipment called a cam. Uh, you don't use it in the climbing gym. You use it if you're like out, outdoor lead climbing. Uh, doesn't really matter. But again, seeing that one example, probably you have little difficulty recognizing that down there on the bottom, there are some other cams, right? Can you see where they are? So is this, did you, did you find them? Is that about right? Okay. Um, how are you able to do that? Right? Notice that the other cams there, they're all different in some ways. I mean, first of all, they're in a different position, different pose, some of them, all of them. Um, they're also all slightly different. They're different shapes, sizes, colors, but they're all the same type of thing. And yet you had no trouble learning that concept and being able to apply it in your new setting. So how, how are you able to do that? Remarkable ability, remarkable part of human concept learning abilities is not just how quickly you can learn a new concept, but also how rich that concept is, right? So when we when we learn a concept like this, we don't just acquire the ability to recognize instances, but in some sense to understand them. So we see that segue and we break it up into some parts and some relations between them, the wheels, the handlebar, the platform, the stick, and so on. We understand something about the structure function relations of those parts. Again, building on a lot of other stuff we already know. But the ability to understand those parts and their relations and how the structure might support some function, absolutely critical to concept, to the concept that we acquire here. We can imagine new examples, right? We could, if we're a good artist, we could draw them. If we're bad artists, we could draw them badly. But we have no trouble imagining other ways these same parts could be arranged to have a, another object of the same type. And we can even imagine combining parts of objects with parts of other objects to imagine yet whole other things that haven't been built yet unless somebody started a company to make them, like this moto unicycle there. I mean, how did the segue come in the first place, right? Or those hoverboards, right? Um, so the, these conceptual abilities, you know, that they, they, they show the richness of our concepts. In a sense, they show the ways in which our concepts are not just discriminative pattern recognition templates, but actually generative models, and generative models with parts that can be recombined with other generative models. So the challenge for us, and really for, for Brendan in this work, is how can we, how can we have both of these things at the same time? How can we have concepts which are so rich and yet learnable so quickly? And you know, again, I won't go into this, but probably make, most of you are familiar with this. There's different paradigms for learning theory, whether you like PAC or Bayes or PAC Bayes, right? Um, it, the same sort of ideas are, hold true, which is, or, or at least in our conventional wisdom and our simple models, which is that the richer the concepts that you're trying to learn, the richer the hypothesis, the more data it should take. So the fact that we can learn such rich concepts from so little data is a serious challenge. Now, that's the problem. In order to tackle that problem, what Brendan, and I should say also that Russ Salukudina, uh, who you know, is mostly known as a deep learning person, he was a key partner in this project too. He really, it was, it was he and me who originally started collecting this data, and then Brendan really took it to the next level or the next 10 levels. Um, but what we were all looking for was a data set, a challenge domain where we could have all of these things, where we could have 
concepts that, that have all these rich properties that we're talking about, like this, um, and yet where we have a reasonable chance of like actually building models that would see much of the structure that people see here the way people see it. This, this, this was the reason why we didn't just, in this project, use you know, segways or, you know, I think to try to do this, ultimately we would like to do this with quote, real visual objects, right? Um, we are working on that, many people are working on that. But I think at this point it's too hard to build models of how we actually learn these concepts because we don't have vision systems that are good enough yet to see the 3D physical structure of these objects that I think are the ways we actually represent these things, both this, the individual instances and the categories. So we wanted a simpler data set, something like you know, the handwritten digits that Jan LeCun used to generate so much really good research in pattern recognition uh, in, in early, earlier years. Uh, but you know, something where there was a reasonable chance of getting it right, of, of actually studying it maybe in the human brain and not just in the mind. Um, and, but it was a real problem, like just like handwritten digits, that like this is real stuff, it's not just a toy problem. Psychologists have many, many toy data sets which they've used for years to study things like one-shot learning. But you know, there are the things which, if you're an AI or machine learning researcher, you look at it and you say, well, it's like this, you know, three boolean, three binary features. Like, can we learn to separate big red squares from little yellow triangles? And that just doesn't seem like it's about the same kinds of things we're trying to do in our real-world AI systems. So this is what led us to this interesting data set of handwritten characters. Um, we, we, when we first started working on this, we contrasted it with the MNIST data set, which where we sometimes call the MNIST transpose, right? Because and this, as well as many other data sets that people used when computer vision first started getting data set serious, right, had, were, were designed to have many, many examples of relatively few categories, like thousands of examples of 10 digits or 10 object categories. And then even with, with ImageNet and other data sets now, you know, we have thousands of examples of thousands of categories. But here we wanted to build a data set in which we had only a few examples, maybe 10 or 20 examples of thousands of categories or 10,000 categories, because this was more like the setting of human concept learning where we're, you know, it's not about um, learning a small number of things to asymptote, but kind of like Nadi, like you were saying last night, like how far can we keep pushing it and keep learning new things pretty well? And what you can see here, well, the data set we built, we call OmniLot. It's inspired and, and dependent on actually a website called OmniLot, which catalogs all the world's writing systems. And we took examples from OmniLot originally from 50 different alphabets, uh, which we then gave to people over the web and asked them to draw their own versions of these things. So what you can see here are hand-drawn hand uh, characters in a bunch of different alphabets. Um, hopefully what you can see is that each of these characters here is a different kind of character, right? These are, this is one example each of many, many different categories. And it's only a small fraction of the categories in this data set. So the data set has, uh, or the whole data set has about 30-something thousand instances because there's about 30 characters in 50 different alphabets, and then there's, a, there's about 20 examples of each one. Um, these days, people in machine learning who've been using this have, have been kind of been uh, extending the data set. Like, for example, if you take the characters and rotate and reflect them, you now have 10,000 things, and that's just sort of in some sense just as good for many purposes. Um, okay, so we have a range of different alphabets, some of which you've probably seen and some of which you probably haven't seen. Um, we have alphabets that you probably haven't seen unless you watch certain TV shows or movies because they were made up like the Futurama TV show alphabet. It's another interesting feature of creativity in this domain, or the concepts in this domain, that they support the ability to actually make up new characters and even whole new alphabets or writing systems. The, the data set is also quite rich in that it's not just patterns of pixels, but it's actually, you know, originally comes from people drawing. So we've recorded and given out as part of this big uh, thing on GitHub um, all the dynamic traces as well. So you can see here, for example, 20 different people drawing this very simple character. And you can see for a character like that, they draw it in pretty consistent ways, right? Basically, everybody draws these two parts, and most people draw the, the red one first and the green one second. Here's a slightly more complex character where you can see the drawings that people make. And they're different, but they're not that different, right? If you think about all the possible ways of putting ink on the page to look like that thing up there, well, you know, there's... It, 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 go on forever trying to think about all the different ways to color pixels. But actually, most people, because of the way we draw strokes and so on, adopt one of a very small number of possible ways to draw this, which reflect, I would like to say, different ways of parsing that shape into its parts and relations. Even for quite complex characters like this one, again, there's a lot of consistency. People sort of see it as these two sub-objects, and they draw one, and then they draw the other in pretty consistent ways. So the, the fact that that consistency is there is something that we, we want to exploit in a learning system. In a sense, we think part of our ability to do one-shot learning here is because we 
actually has internalized models that are shared across people and that reflect both how these things are generated and how other people are going to understand them. Um, the, uh, it's, it's also the case in this data set that or this domain that you have the kind of one-shot learning that we're talking about with richer natural object categories. So just to demonstrate that, here's two examples from some alphabets, which I don't even remember which ones they are. Um, probably most of you don't know this alphabet, but I can show you this character here, and now we can go through this and let you know see somewhere in these 20 other characters from the same alphabet, you'll see somebody else has drawn the same character, hopefully. Just as a little demo, I'll just move my mouse and let's just say clap when you see another instance of that uh, concept. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Sense of drama, attention was building up. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so as you can see, people are basically perfect at this task, right? Um, very, very high accuracy, very low error rates. Okay, and it's also the case that here you can um, you can get many of these other kinds of things. So people can draw new instances, not just copy, but like actually imagine other ways of drawing the same character. They can parse them into parts and relations, and they can even make up whole new characters. Um, so, for example, these are this is somebody making up four new characters in this alphabet, right? I think don't mean anything, <laughs> um, but people just made them up. Okay. Um, so how, 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 that's the data. How are you able now, or how are we trying to model what people are doing? So the approach that we present in this work is what we call Bayesian program learning. And I want to talk about it both because it illustrates a very concrete version of one of these probabilistic programs, and then something about how you could use it for inference and learning. And then in the second part of the talk, I will talk more about sort of harder problems of common sense scene understanding that might take these ideas to a, yet another level. So the, the basic schematic here, and I should say also that we think of you know, probabilistic programs and Bayesian program learning as a, as a very general approach. What we've actually done in this work, though, is to develop one specific instance of that approach. So the model that we have here is a model that learns to, well, actually learns to learn handwritten characters. It doesn't learn other things, though the general principles, we think, are, you know, are much more general. Um, and that remains to be seen by us and other people who are trying to build these models and in a bunch of other kinds of domains of concept learning. But here I'll, here I'll illustrate the ideas in this particular setting. Um, I'll, I'll illustrate it also by way of how it, how it instantiates some more general principles. So we talk in the paper about what we call principles, key, sort of key principles for learning rich models very quickly. Um, the idea of compositionality, that's probably the number one idea. Um, the idea of causality um, and learning to learn. So let me illustrate what I mean by these principles uh, in, in this context. So by compositionality, we mean the idea that we, we see these objects as being made of some pieces, and we see our concepts in turn being made of some piece, pieces of concepts. So we, we see these objects in terms of wheels, handlebars, uh, seats, motors, and so on, and then we see a new instance of a new category, and we, we somehow understand it in terms of the same pieces. And that's, that's got to be crucial, we think, for um, how we're able to learn these rich concepts so quickly. The, the idea of causality, I mean, that can mean many things. I've talked about, about some different kinds of causality already, and we'll talk about more here. In the context of handwritten characters, we just mean, what are the basic processes in the world which produce, again, the patterns of ink on the page? Well, it's, at, 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 at most basic level, a motor system. Like, these are drawn by hand. Okay, It doesn't have to be your hand. You can draw handwritten characters well with your other hand, or with your toe, or with your nose. But human motion has certain basic dynamics, and that inherits to the, the nature of this data set. But more generally, these are action plans, right? Um, characters writing and a lot of language built on this. It's a goal-driven thing. You're, you have a goal to, to make a certain thing in the world, and you have a plan with some parts that you implement in your motor system. And there's a lot of prior evidence that people represent both handwritten and even typeset characters um, in terms of something like the motor plans that produce them. I'm not going to go into that evidence. I'm just saying it's, it motivates why we think of this is a domain, you might not have thought of this as an interesting domain to do causal inference, but we do think there are some minimal kinds of causal inference here. Causal inference is much richer than, than what's going on here, but this is just a sort of minimal causality in the same way that it also has a kind of minimal compositionality. And then the last part of what I call learning to learn, it's closely related to other ideas, notions in machine learning and AI, like multitask learning or transfer learning or lifelong learning. But the idea that when we learn something, we learn a particular concept, we don't just learn that concept or about that kind of thing, 
a week, but we learn something maybe more general that can now help us learn new concepts more quickly. Uh, there's great examples of this in the developmental psychology literature that I don't really have time to go into, but just for example, to refer you to the work of Linda Smith and colleagues, where they studied what's called the shape bias. So they, they, they showed that between about one and a half and two years of age, kids who are learning English don't just learn the names for particular things, like that the word ball refers to things like that over there, or cup refers to things like that, but they learned that a whole class of words in some sense refers to a whole class of object concepts, namely a noun that labels a, an artifact, right? some, some kind of non-biological category, some thing, toy, tool, tends to pick out other things of the same shape. Balls are ball-shaped, cups are cup-shaped, hammers are hammer-shaped, cars are car-shaped, X's are X-shaped. And that abstract variable X there can apply even to this thing here. So if you show a two-year-old that thing and you say that's a DAX, and then you show them other things which might match in color or material properties or shape, they prefer to pick out the thing that has the same shape. And this is learned. It's not something that a one-and-a-half-year-old reliably does, but in various ways that they've studied both through kind of correlations and even interventional experiments, this kind of ability is learned. It's, it's a learning to learn. They, they, by learning the things on the left, they learn uh, this more generalizable shape bias, which can apply to new concepts and help you generalize them from just one example. Okay, so we, we try to put all those pieces together to build models in this domain of how you could say take this concept, this, this instance of a new concept here, and learn a reusable, generalizable, causal generative model from just one instance. And, you know, again, hopefully at this point it should be fairly clear what we're talking about. Um, let's say you were a subject in one of our experiments, and I showed you that thing, and I said, now imagine how you would draw it. So just everybody draw that in the air in front of you. Yeah. Okay. So you probably did something like this. These are six different participants in the experiment. And what we're, we're trying to explain how you're able to see that, see, see that, and then figure out this generative program using these ideas. So now just to get a little bit more technical, um, this is the picture I showed you before. When I say we've got probabilistic programs here, there's two levels of programs. So there's what, what we call token generating programs. That's the bottom level here. These are the concepts. So each program here is, represents one visual concept. So like uh, just a point here, I guess. This is, for example, a sketch of one of these, uh, a program that will generate, well, these things here. It does it by describing the abstract strip structure and then the variance in that in that template, basically. So the, every, you know, it's a probabilistic program. What that means in its most basic sense is every time you run it, you get a different output. And the, the random choices that the program makes reflect structured variability in that concept. Capturing that variability within the concept is really critical here. So when you say call this program several times, here are three different stroke traces that it might produce. And then there's another stage which puts ink on the page according to those strokes. So here are three ultimate outputs of that program. And you could run it a bunch of times and get yet more instances of that. And here are two examples of a different uh, character's program, and here are two examples of another character's program. Now, there's a higher level program, which we call a type generating program. The outputs of this program, what it returns, are token generators, right? So this is like a prior or a hypothesis generator. It's a program that generates other programs. This is the level that captures our general knowledge about the domain. Learning to learn actually happens at both of these levels, but like the most deepest kind of learning to learn is at this level. Where we we we're, we're, here we're, we we have the idea that there are these basic kind of stroke primitives that we can arrange them into subparts and parts and I won't really go into the details but basically a subpart is like continuous motion um, then um, you can if you if you stop and start moving again that's just another subpart of the same part if you actually pick up your hand that's a whole other part and so on um, so here at, at this level we can uh, if we call this program. It imagines, in a sense, a new a new character. It can be a character in general, or these type generators can be specialized to particular alphabets to just generate characters of a particular type by kind of tuning the parameters of these probabilistic productions here. And then the output of that is a imagined new character, which, when you run that, produces produces um, these things on the bottom. And the idea of Bayesian program learning is to basically work backwards from what you observe there to come up with a token generator that it has high prior probability under the type generator, but also has high likelihood on the observed data. The learning to learn again goes on basically in, um, well, the way we, we implement this in our work is we, we have a held out set of characters that are not the main ones we do our tests on. Um, you, can, you can hold out different subsets of data, and that's actually kind of interesting to ask how much data do you need to learn to learn. But from that held out set, we, we, we can learn about these action primitives. 
We can learn something about the likely relations, how they're put together. We can learn priors on the number of strokes, the number of substrokes, something about the typical ways that things tend to be attached. So this is all the learning to learn business. Um, and it's you know, very, very dependent on how this exactly works, but I'm just not going to go into details, just say it, it has to happen. Um, then that, that is what allows you to build up the parameters in this uh, in these generating programs, such that then when I observe a new instance, I can work backwards in a kind of Bayesian inference to say, well, what is the type generating or the token generating program that is most likely to explain what I've seen? And again, there's a lot of work you could do to do inference uh, or make inference more or less efficient here. The actual inference algorithms that Brendan uses in this paper are not very efficient. One of the things we're trying to do right now is to actually use neural networks to optimize this inference, to make this inference much more efficient. But I, I can talk about that later if you'd like. Um, okay. um, so let me just show you how this model now is um, deployed to solve a couple of problems, in particular these one-shot classification tasks and some of these more creative tasks. So to do classification, what, what hopefully this illustrates more or less what we do. Let's say we see this example of that new character, and then we want to see which of these test items here uh, is, an, is another instance of the same character. Well, we infer the most likely parses of this, um, and each of these parses basically is a, is a different candidate token generating program. And then we see how, how well those parses explain the ink, basically, that we get from these other instances. And what you see, these negative numbers are negative log scores. So these are negative log scores in explaining this data, and these are negative log scores for the best program of, this, of the top few candidates here that explains this thing. So um, a, a, you know, a, a smaller number in absolute value is better. right? This is like uh, 2 to the negative 505 or something. Okay, so there's very low probability of producing any of these patterns of ink. But hopefully what you can see here is the one that we all agree is an instance of the same concept is you know, about 1,000 log points better um, explained than uh, these other ones. It's not as well explained as the training example sense, but it's so much better explained than all these other ones by these templates that that's the basis for just being very confident which is the right instance of that concept. So when we apply this now to these 20-way these classification tasks, well here I'm just showing a bar graph of some results. So the pink bar is humans, and this is percent errors. So again, humans are 5% are or, or better on these tasks. Um, chance would be 95% because it's a 20-way task, and it's a pretty hard 20-way task because we take the distractors from the from other things in the same alphabet. Okay. Um, what you can see here, these, these reddish bars are ones from different versions of Bayesian program learning. The full model is the red bar, which really matches human performance levels, um, maybe even a little bit better. And then the orange and yellow ones are various lesioned versions of the model, where you know, we take out the learning to learn, or we take out the compositionality. These blue green bars are various attempts to get some kind of deep convolutional network to do as well as possible, and I, I won't go through the details there, but I pretty confident that at least using off-the-shelf standard things, and even specially engineered, like for example, deep Siamese nets. This was a lot of Russ's contribution to the project, is he actually had a, you know, he's one of the best deep learning people out there, and he had a master's student working for a year or more on trying to solve exactly this problem. And even the best specially engineered continents are still two or three times worse than people on this task or the Bayesian program learning. The lesion versions of Bayesian program learning are particularly interesting. So here, we say, well, what happens if we get rid of any of the learning to learn or some key parts of the parameter tuning? So we use just a much more generic kind of smooth motor action model. Or what if we get rid of compositionality, which means we just say everything is one single stroke instead of having parts and subparts. And those matter. Those, that's, that, if you get rid of either of those, that's the orange and yellow bars. You're not doing nearly as well as people or as the full model. Um, let me just show you one other kind of more creative task. This is something which we call the simple kind of visual Turing test because we're comparing human cre in, uh, creation of new examples with the, our machine system. So in each of these cases here, we ask people to look at this one example and imagine a few other instances of the same uh, thing. And uh, in each of these panels of nine figures, we have basically nine people doing this task and our machine giving nine examples. And let's see if you can tell the difference between humans and the machines, okay? So um, raise your hand if you think these ones here are drawn by machine, the ones on the left. Raise your hand if you think these are the machine. Okay, slight preference for that one. Um, how many people say these are the machine? How many people say these are the machine? Okay, good. How many people say these are the machine? How many people say these are the machine? Okay, good. How many people say these are the machine over here? How many people say these are the machine? Okay. Um, 
So it, yeah, that's interesting. I, 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 I think people, how, raise your hand if you got them all right. Raise your hand if you got three out of four right. Yeah, I think a lot of people seem to go for the ones on the right. Um, how about here? Can you tell which ones are the humans or the machines? I'll give you a hint. It's not all on the right. <laughs> um, you, you can tell. Did anybody get them all right? Anybody get three out of four? Yeah, it's a pretty hard task. How about here? You can tell. Yeah, my best guess is that on average you got about two out of four right. Because in our experiments, people are basically a chance here. So this is what this is. This is. This is now the performance of human judges trying to tell apart humans from machines on a bunch of tasks. I just showed you the easiest one, um, but others involve, for example, making up whole new characters and alphabets. And for most of these tasks, pe people basically can't tell. There's a few people who are above chance, but most people can't tell. So it's a sign that at least in this simple domain, I think we've captured to human level abilities both classification, but also the ability to imagine new instances of a concept. Um, this is just showing what happens if you take the lesions model and get it to do. And you can see just its drawings are not nearly as good, whether you lesion compositionality or lesion learning to learn. It's just, it understands less about this domain. It's just, it's, you know, it's a much weaker inductive bias, basically. It's just dr dr drawing much, much more random but smooth stuff. Okay. Um, there's many interesting ongoing directions one could take this kind of research in. Um, I, I, I won't go into most of them, but I'll, I'll just say if you're interested, particularly uh, you know, on the pattern recognition side or deep networks, there's been some, you know, a bunch of people in the deep learning community have taken up this challenge and trying to get machines to solve this. But I'll just show you one of the examples of one of the most successful things, just again to point to what it's good at and what it isn't get good at. This is work from Danilo Resende and colleagues at DeepMind. Um, they had this paper called um, One Shot Learning in Deep Generative Models. And an impressive figure from their paper is this one, where they gave, the, this, is a, this is a kind of, it's a recurrent, if you know the draw network, it's a kind of attention-based recurrent network. It's very well suited. I think it's called drawing. It's really motivated by how people draw things. Um, and it's, it's potentially well suited to this problem. Um, they give it uh, one example of each of these hammering characters, and then what you can see in the things in the column below are other, draw, other instances that it has imagined. And in some ways, I think this figure is you know, impressive and designed to look impressive. Um, raise your hand, is it impressive? Yeah, it's impressive. Okay, what makes it impressive, I think, is that the things that this network, you know, having trained on a very big version of this data set, you know, doesn't start off knowing anything about characters. It's learned to produce other things which look more like the instance than they do like the other instances. Okay, um, but if you look carefully at many of the columns, like these ones here, within a column, they don't look all that similar to each other, right? Like people would never say that most of these things. Yeah, I mean, they're similar to each other. But they're not all the same character. In fact, they're mostly different characters, right? Um, same is true for you know at least half of these examples, right? So it's it's impressive, but yet the fact that it's that in some sense no, but this would never pass one of those Turing tests, right? Is a sign that I think the current approaches in in this system and in deep learning more general haven't sufficiently internalized these ideas of compositionality and causality. There's a lot of learning to learn here, but I think unless you have the right kinds of compositional representations, learning to learn isn't going to do nearly the work that it needs to do. In other sorts of work, we and others are extending this to many other kinds of concept learning domains. And for example, speech, learning, learning new spoken words, from this, another thing we can do remarkably well from one example, um, is something where we think this kind of idea can also apply. I won't go into the details of this because I want to spend at least a few minutes talking about the second half of the talk, but I'm happy to talk about this more later if you're interested. Just to sum up then the, the main stuff in the first part, we tried to tackle this problem of how can you learn such rich concepts from one or a few examples and suggested a framework, this idea of Bayesian program learning, which reflects these more, hopefully more general principles, compositionality, causality, learning to learn, and then by doing some kind of hierarchical Bayesian inference over these, these programs and programs that generate programs, we think that might be a powerful way to think about these model building activities. Now, what about scene understanding? So here what I'm talking about is this kind of thing. I'm talking about the stuff that you see in the youngest kids. So you look at these babies, like this fellow here, um, Stacking up blocks, right? The, the movie's long, and I only have about 10 minutes, so I'm going to cut to the, the chase. But you can see, well, actually, there's one key moment that might happen around. Let's see. Here. Let's see. Uh, get to the, at some point, he's building the stack, playing with these cups. Okay, at some point here, it's very quick. He takes a stack of two and puts it on a stack of three. Okay, see that? So there's compositionality for you, right? He has the concept of a stack, and a stack, it's, a stack isn't just a stack of blocks, but it might be a stack of stacks, okay? And he keeps going, and eventually this gets, there's another stack on there. 
Um, and uh, it's on the very top. He's super proud of himself. <laughs> <laughs> no robot could do any of that. Could build that stack, could want to build that stack, could be happy when he's done, could fall over because he's so happy, and then get back up again <laughs> without having half of DARPA go and scoop him off the floor. Um, here's an even younger baby. Um, one of 200,000 training examples of two, three, or four cubes, you can solve that problem better than people. But there's no sign that that system is going to generalize to all the different things that people can do. It doesn't mean it couldn't. And we have a workshop at NIPS this year, which we've co-organized with Lehrer and, and Rob Fergus, who's the senior author there. And you know, we're, we're actively interested in what are the ways that neural nets and generative models can work together. For example, here's a project from, from, our, from our group that we call Galileo, where it's one way that neural nets and physics engines can work nicely together. Where people see these things where an object like slides down an inclined plane like Galileo used to do back in the day and hits another object and maybe the object moves some distance. And you try to look at the scene and figure out what's going to happen or what's the mass or the friction of these objects. And it combines the idea of a simulation, which here, when that simulation is running, you can see the effects of different mass and friction parameters on the outcome of this sliding event. With a deep network that looks at yeah, I'll, I'll stop after this, which looks at the um, you know the visual patterns like the, the surface texture, uses that to make an initial guess of the mass and friction that are then the inputs to this physics engine, and that guess can be revised as you see the dynamics. So here we're using a deep continent for something that networks are good at, namely looking at visual texture and making guesses of a few basic parameters. But then we're using the physics engine to get to, to find the dynamic implications of that. And really, this is a place where the two approaches really help each other out. And it's, it, we can do things with this combination that we couldn't do with either one. All right, so I will skip very quickly through other cool things you can do with physics and vision. And I'll also, since, since I'm out of time, I'll say, if, you, if you're interested, we could either talk about this at lunch or tea. I'm told that we can, those of you who are at TTI, we can have a, a further discussion in tea. But if you want to talk about, say, for example, what I think are maybe the deepest things of how can you not just do the physics, but also like infer people's goals, like how you can look at somebody reaching like this and figure out what are they reaching for. We can build these things on top of physics because physics are the constraints that your action has to obey, and then work backwards to like the goals that are inputs to planning programs. Okay. Um, so talk more about that later if you're interested. Just to wrap up then, I've, I've tried to sketch out what I hope is a path forward for AI going beyond just pattern recognition to these model building abilities. And to try to show how these sort of general principles of causal models and compositional models to actually support model building progressively over multiple tasks can be used to explain some distinctive aspects of human intelligence that currently don't fit into just the pattern recognition toolbox. And then with technologies from like probabilistic programs, program induction, and this game engine in the head sort of idea, these are, these are helping us to actually make these things real in engineering level terms. But I'm sure you can all see there's lots of open questions about how this could scale up to harder, bigger problems of AI. And if you're interested in those things, I'd love to talk with you and maybe even work with you more on them. Thanks. In the, in the handwritten characters or in these later things? So generally, just okay. the abstract sense, why do we need programs and why not some other kind of generative model which, 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 which has uncertainty built in? And also, how much of the success is in the hidden symmetries and hidden uh, natural distortions that we are embedding into, this pro into these programs? Because we are not using just any program, just any kind of uncertainty there. Yeah. We still are hard coding something. Okay, well, there's a, there's a few things, so let me try to unpack your question. Um, I tried to address this at the beginning about when I contrasted programs with, say, networks, right? So Bayesian networks are probabilistic generative models built on one kind of knowledge representation, which is a directed graph, okay? Whereas this is just, think of this as a generalization. Of, it's very, it's, you can think of it as like a template for an infinite set of potentially infinite Bayes nets. That's one way to think of it, where the Bayes net is like the trace of the program, right? Just, I mean, it's a basic... Thing I think we mostly take for granted in computer science, that some kinds of knowledge can be represented with a directed graph, but not everything, <laughs> right? A lot of, if we want to describe processes in the world, sometimes a graph is reasonable, okay? Um, but
but other times we actually need to write a program. If there's any kind of recursion, if there's processes which can generate other processes, a graph can only sketch what that looks like, whereas a program can make it real. So by defining probabilistic models over programs, it's just a more expressive model building language. Does that, make, does that address your first thing? Okay. It's not to say you need programs, right? It's just programs are extremely valuable for and we think that if you like other approaches, like if you like neural networks, then you should be thinking about how to take these, some of the key ideas of programs and program learning and put them into that framework. That's really the message of that archive paper I mentioned at the beginning. Okay. Now, for the second thing, well, the second question was what, how, what about work being done by things we hard code in? Yes, that's right. So for any of the models I talked about here, there's some stuff that we as the modelers hard code in and some other things that we learn or estimate from data. And I think... There's a, there's a certain movement in, in, in some areas of machine learning and AI, which is a, against the idea of hard coding. But I would really want to push back on that. I think it's not plausible technologically. It's not plausible biologically either. Much of our intelligence is actually coded into our genes. The ability to reason about these physical objects like that is something which is shared by many other animals and it's present as, as near as we can tell in some ways from birth. It also is learned. There's a lot of learning about physics that happens over the first few months of life. And developmental psychologists who study infants study that. Right? But it's, 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 it's really unrealistic to think that there aren't basic things about physics and physical objects that are built into our brains. And in work in neuroscience, I can even show you which brain systems they are. They're very reliable in everybody. Okay? Um, there, there's evidence that they're present in even in young infants. Okay? Um, more generally, I think we need to think about learning in ways that, the, you know, that things that we might, in any one stage of our model building, hard code, we might want to build learning algorithms that code. <laughs> Learning isn't just parameter tuning. Well, it's, that's, that's a valuable thing to be able to do. And one way to think about, say, gradient-based learning in neural nets or other machine learning systems is that you have a, like a differentiable program, right? You have a, a program where all the code is written, except for a bunch of numbers which you have to tune to make it work better. But there are many other aspects of programming that involve like writing new functions or writing new code. And real human learning involves those kinds of things, too. So we need to... We need to not be afraid of building systems that capture some ability with something that's hard-coded, and then write algorithms which can modify the code. We were, it, we're, at right now, we and other people are able to do very simple versions of that. But if you want to ask where is this going over you know, a time span of years or decades, that's one of the main directions towards, it, towards you could call it algorithmic programming or program synthesis. It's a very exciting area of work that most people in machine learning aren't even really aware of. But it's, it's maturing on a slow but steady and sometimes even quite fast, exciting pace. And I think that's the basis for building more human-like learning algorithms to capture these kinds of things. Um, all right. So as the programming languages person in the room, I'm going to ask the PL question. Um, so do you do any kind of program synthesis, by the way? No, no, no. I'm, I'm not in program synthesis at all in, in semantics. Um, so, are there pain points that you're seeing with current programming paradigms? And if you could, if you could rule the world, and say, okay, in order to support this vision, yes, we would, we would like programming languages to go in this direction, please. What would that direction be? I mean, like in particular, so-called probabilistic programming languages, or well, for, for, so yeah. for example. Oh, um, well, okay. So, yeah. So, so. There are many pain points, right? AI and cognition is hard. Um, one that do, do, so there's a one that a lot of progress has been made on recently that's much less painful now than it was two years ago is, is inference. So I talked about how the most basic thing we do we write a program, uh, a probabilistic program, we condition on the output, and we want to infer something about the inputs or the program traits that led to that. That's a that's a hard kind of probabilistic inference. It's the sort of thing that people in graphical models in the machine learning and statistics communities worked on for, have worked on for decades. And when people first started writing these probabilistic generative models in programs, you know, five to ten years ago, inference was a complete disaster. <laughs> now, there are tools you can get in your, in your you know, web browser. So, for example, if, if anyone wants to play around with this, check out a, um, there's a web book on, on the site, probmob.org. Go to V2. Um, if you just Without V2, you get an older, actually, you can compare V1 and V2. So V1 was written about five years ago by Noah Goodman and, and myself. Noah is one of the main leaders in probabilistic programs. He's at Stanford. He did almost all of the work. And he did all, basically all of the work to create, to move it over to V2. And you can see the difference between the inference technology and V2 using the first, the V1 was a language called Church. Uh, 
And B2 uses a language called Web People or Web PPL for Web Probabilistic Programmers. Church is based on Scheme and Web People is based on JavaScript. That's not really the main difference. The main difference is a lot of there's a lot more different inference algorithms and a lot better inference algorithms here. And this was part of a DARPA program that was that came out of the PL community. It was called Panel Probabilistic Programming for Advancing Machine Learning, where they asked that question, and what people said was, "We need better work on inference." And this is a real payoff of that. Um, we can now use this in classes, and people use this for research. Whereas Church, when it was first came out about five years ago, was basically just a just an illustrative thing. Um, at the same time, much more work is needed. We need also ways to, uh, you know, probably. Like if you take inspiration from neural networks where the hardware acceleration of GPUs was absolutely critical, we need ways to get at least some kind of parallelizable uh, inference from web for probabilistic programming, whether it's in GPUs or just other some other you know thing that can do a lot of parallelism basically. Um, we, but then there's the learning side, right? So I talked about program induction, and there's another part of the PL community that people do program synthesis. Um, it's a really exciting area, you know. Like, I don't. How many people know about uh, what's called Flashville? This is a, a, a raise your hand about Flashville. Or if you've heard of Sumit Golani, he's one of the people. You, you probably know him. He's a PL person. Okay. Well, because it shows how big that community is. So Sumit is a researcher at Microsoft, and he's built a kind of one-shot program learner. It's kind of like what we did for the handwritten characters. Only his is actually in, in Excel, not unfortunately in the Mac version of Excel. But it's, you might have seen this, or you can sort of imagine how it would work. It's a system where you know he's trying to automate a lot of routine tasks you might do in Excel, where let's say you have one column of text or dates or something, names or dates or whatever, addresses, and you want to kind of convert all of them over to another format. Like you want to take people's names and convert it to initials. Or you want to take birth dates written out as like January 21st, 1974, and turn it into numbers, you know, 1 slash 21 slash 74. Okay. So, you know, you could write a simple program to do that, but it would be much more convenient for users if you could just give one or a few examples, and then it figures out what you're trying to do and fills it all in. And he's actually built a system that does that with the performance characteristics that it works as a product. It's fast and reliable enough that it actually ships with Excel. And he did it by, you know, he didn't he didn't think he was doing what we were doing. It's kind of convergent evolution. But he did many of the same kinds of things we're talking about here. And some of our students have done internships with him, and we're, you know, this is just one of one place where these communities of basically sort of human-like machine learning and AI and program synthesis with people who are very good PL people <laughs> are moving in this direction. If you're interested in that kind of thing, if you have a PL background, I think it's a great area to work in. My colleague at MIT, Armando Solar Lazama, is another person working on that. And if you're not, if you're more interested in machine learning and you don't know about the relevant stuff in programming languages and program synthesis and automated programming, I highly recommend you try to learn it <laughs> because it's a whole other toolkit that's quite valuable, um, but will require investment of people, you know, really who are students or postdocs who are at the stage in your life when you can learn these very different world sets. Um, and I, I really want to encourage people to do that. You know, all the stuff with neural networks or all the stuff before that with graphical models was really driven by people who were able to learn to bridge different worlds. And I think I'm really glad you're here from, from programming languages because I think that's actually one of the things we most need. Sorry to go on it. On a whole sermon about that, but it's, that's actually those two questions were like the most important questions to ask. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think uh, that's all the questions again. Uh, if you would like to uh, talk with uh, Josh.